All right. Well, we want to welcome you back to the Biblical History Center podcast. It's uh, It's been a little while. Emily, are you there? I am. <laughs> it's definitely been a little while for us. We have been extremely busy. And of course, as you all have heard before, uh, since we went through the transition of, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we lost Brian. And uh, as you can tell on our YouTube, as well as our podcast, uh, we've definitely missed Brian. We hope he's doing very well. We know he's doing very well. Uh, and we're grateful for that. But as you can tell, Uh, We've been very, very busy. So having that additional person to help us get us going has been difficult. So today we figured it out, uh, of course, among ourselves. Uh, uh, Today, Christy is not with us, but Miss Emily Pritchett is. And Emily, you uh, you recently discovered a couple of items that we'll discuss today. Let's first talk about, I mean, t- what is going on that is, what is going on in the archaeological world that is threatening a major airport shutdown? This article was really cool, and it came out June 12th, so literally about two days ago. Um, and the, it was a discovery of a 4,000 year old structure in Greece. Right now, archaeologists don't know what it is, <laughs> and it threatens the major airport construction. It's actually for a new international airport um, that Crete, the island of Crete, which wow. is a part of Greece, the country of Greece, um, is planning on building in order to help its tourism industry. Um, we have a, a joke in the archaeological community that if you do not know what it is, you automatically assume it is cultic in its right. nature. Right, right. Prior to finding out the real purpose. Now um, apparently it's a it's a it's a Minoan structure, is that correct? Yes, it's a Minoan structure and from the look of it, the architecture it's unknown for sure. It's yeah, an unknown it's purpose definitely unknown, because of the design. Is that correct? Is it because of the unique design? Because it, it is, resembles. It's part of the uni- it is. It's part of the unique design. But what was really intriguing was that at the site, there were animal bones that were found. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Um, so there were animal bones that were found. And one of my many questions that I had was what specific kind of animal bones are we dealing with here? Because... It was very common back in um, back during that time period to sacrifice certain animals to the right. gods to right. gain favor. Right. And so um, if we find out what those animal bones were, it can give us better context. Um, however, there are some archaeologists in the community that think this structure is probably a tomb structure, and it might be the remains of a of the Minoan beehive tomb. So it's built to look like a beehive, um, that sort of rounded canonical shape. Well, there, there and, it, um, for those that are just listening, uh, yeah. it, it resembles a, almost like a huge car wheel, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? It's, yes. it's uh, from what we are reading, it's in, from what's been discovered, it's about 157 foot in diameter and 19,000 square foot uh, as far as the area is concerned. Uh, and, and Emily, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, similar to the Minoan tombs, I mean, these bones have just completely complicated the site's understanding. Uh, and as mentioned, and as you mentioned, the, the ritual use, uh, I mean, it's it's thrown everything off. I mean, it's it's almost... Uh, I think they're going to be there a lot longer. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think that airport's going to be built uh, anytime soon, Carlos. I think, <laughs> and it also said more down at the bottom towards this article yeah, that yeah. that in following this structure being discovered, they actually discovered twenty five other archaeological sites. So I think they are definitely going to be there a lot longer, and the airport situation um greece is very greece israel and other countries are very very self-aware of how much of the world's history they possess and they try to do their best to preserve that history right um, Right. as best as possible so i have no doubt that there's going to be some measures taken as to how they want to excavate the site preserve the site etc 
um, before this airport does get built. Um, so it's right now, I'm going to have to imply the joke that we in the archaeology community say it's definitely cultic in its nature until we find its true purpose. Is right. it a tomb? Is it a living structure? Was it a temple structure that they made sacrifices to? We don't know. But I think that in the coming months, if they do continue to excavate at this site, th the answers will probably start to slowly be revealed as to what the true nature of this uh, of this um structure is i mean we definitely need to keep an eye on this i mean mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. from what the government is saying i mean their stance is uh you know the greek culture minister was emphasizing uh you know the reconciliation taking place which is no problem but you know their stance are saying they're going to have to find an alternate uh radar station uh because of the additional <laughs> 35 archaeological sites that were uncovered there i mean it's yeah, we definitely need, I mean, even us here, uh, we recently added an additional exhibit in one of our classrooms to focus a little bit more, uh, a little more depth to the Greco-Roman world. So this this, this is uh, certainly exciting for us uh, just to see what will come out of this. Uh, I, Emily, I'm guessing you're going to be watching this one, aren't you? Yes, I'm going to be keeping close tabs on this one. To, I can't wait to see what the uh, the teams that are going to be excavating there recover and eventually find out what this is. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that I think that's just going to continue to add uh, and bring tourism even more to Crete, for sure. Uh, now that, you know, uh, most of those sites are historically preserved, uh, and there's major tourist attractions, uh, and there's been an influx, and, and this could threaten the integrity of the ancient sites. So, mm -hmm. you know, the Greek government has implemented measures to protect these sites, uh, especially when it comes to limiting the Acropolis in Athens, uh, you know, along those lines. So, you know, I, I would say we definitely need to continue to watch it. We definitely need to continue uh, to be aware of what's taking place. But once we do, I, I think it'd be great for us to come back on and revisit this. What do you think, Emily? I think we definitely need a part two or a part three or however many parts we could probably make this into a series, depending right. on how long they decide to stay there. Right. Well, well, speaking of of structures that are unknown, uh, let's let's transition into uh, structures that are known. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of what has taken place uh, on an island. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this, Emily, that you recently discovered as well. So this site is definitely not cultic in its nature. We definitely know what it was used for. And it was used in the making of purple dye. Now, those of you who know all about purple dye in the ancient world, you know purple dye was more worth more than gold yeah. in the yeah. ancient world. Um, and it has to do to how valuable this dye commodity was. for sure. Mm -hmm. It was a commodity. Um, it was just as, it, again, it was worth more than gold. And I want to say it was worth more than salt as well, because Roman soldiers were paid in salt and salt was very precious. Um, but purple dye itself was so precious that at one point, the Roman government actually made it a law that only the emperor himself yeah. could wear robes of purple made out of purple dye. Right. Um, and where this purple dye factory, they're literally calling it a purple dye factory. Factory workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A workshop, yeah. yeah. It was unearthed in Colonna, which is located on a small island off of Aegina, off the coast of mainland Greece. So this is sort of still around the Greek islands. Right. But right. it just goes to show you the purple dye industry and how far spread it was. I mean, we have. Yeah, it, it's it's a production site. It is. <laughs> you know it what is I mean? It's a production the, site. Right, right. The older building that was identified as a dye production site. I mean, it, based on those findings, that is incredible. Absolutely incredible. I mean, you were blown away when you uh, when you discovered it as well, wouldn't you say? Yes, I was very blown away. And the fact that they what was even more um, intriguing, not just the structures, the structure that itself that was found, they found pieces of pottery that were used in the purple dye process. And the reason they knew it was the purple dye process is this purple dye was still 
after 3,600 years was yeah. still preserved yeah. on yeah. the pottery itself. And that is something archaeologists do not find often. It is very, very rare to find any type of fabric that is any type of fabric or any type of pottery that contains a type of different colored dye. It's very rare because the molecules in our modern air do not agree with the ancient stuff and the ancient stuff will start to disintegrate. It's it's what um, they call the, the, uh, the Tyrian purple, right? Yes. They call it the Tyrian purple. And um, this snail that the purple dye comes from, it's actually still in existence today. So not only is this breed of snail um, common in the ancient world, it is still alive and thriving in the Mediterranean today. Mm. Um, there are still parts of modern day parts of Greece, Cyprus, and North Africa that still make purple dye the exact same way that it was made 3,600 years ago. That's that's basically uh, modern day Lebanon, isn't it? it yeah, so Tyre, um, so Tyrian, so Tyre is right now it's the capital of modern day Lebanon, but back in ancient times, it was one of the main city states yeah, for yeah. the um for the civilization of the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were very well known as seafarers and sea traders. Uh, parts of their civilization have been found all over the coastlines of the Mediterranean, even as far west as uh, Great Britain even and they were very good at what they did but they were very well known for their very high quality purple garments right. and this is actually where king david got his garments from was from tyre and that's why it's even called tyrian purple yeah. it's because that yeah. is how much the phoenicians cranked out the purple dye industry and and I mean it was I mean it was it was there was a restriction uh, you know by the law that only Roman emperors could could really own this. Uh, yeah, I mean if we flash um, which Phoenicia Phoenicia we usually see traces of the Phoenicians in the Old Testament if we look into the right. Old Testament of the of the the scriptures of the Bible. But if we fast forward to the New Testament, purple dye is still a thing. Because the emperor of Rome himself and his family are wearing it. Um, and like I said before, it was such a, it was so much worth its, what it's was worth more than gold oh, yeah. to the point, to the point where the ancient Romans literally put it into law that the only person to wear purple was the emperor himself. Mm -hmm. it is, and that's uh... interesting. What was I think what what uh, was even more insightful as as they begin to dig and they begin to unearth these bones of uh, young mammals, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and of course, from what they discovered, they were heavily burnt. And I, I would say this would suggest that they were more than likely sacrificed as a ritual to protect the production site. Wouldn't you say that would have been the approach? It could have been. Um, you are dealing, we have to think about the context. We have to especially right. think about the pagan context. Um, this is, um, think about it, if this dates, you know, 3,600 years ago, these are the ancient Greco-Roman deities that we are dealing with here. Right, right. Um, many of them do require animal sacrifice. And since we are dealing with the sea, it would not come across... Um, as strange that these people would have more than likely been sacrificing to Poseidon, who is the god of the seas, mm. um, where they because you you yeah, have these fishermen, Absolutely. yeah you you have these fishermen that go out and you know even though they're they're diving for these snails, they don't know if they're going to drown, they don't know if a sea if a storm is going to come up on the sea, um, so that's more than likely they're sacrificing to Poseidon if there is a ritualistic. Um, aspect to this involvement taking place right well i would say this was this was incredibly insightful uh to find this workshop uh this production site uh in in in, in just i i was i was pretty impressed by it for sure i mean i know you were 
when you sent this over. I mean, this is just a just a a great addition to archaeological findings that are taking place around the world. And uh, today, uh, friends, as you listen to our podcast, um, I do want to say that we will continue to do the best that we can to bring you additional podcasts. But I hope today has been insightful. We definitely don't want to take too much of your time, uh, but we thank you for listening. We hope uh, that not only you learned something today as far as that's what's taking place in the archaeological world, uh, but that you continue to support us here uh, in the States, uh, in LaGrange, Georgia, as we continue bringing the ancient biblical world alive uh, here at the Biblical History Center. As always, uh, I am Carlos Cantu, your executive director with Miss Emily Pritchett our Associate Director of Programming and Education. Emily, we'll see you soon. And everyone, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Catch y'all next time. Bye-bye.